Friends, welcome. My name is Stephen Fetter. I manage the United Learning Program for the General Counsel Office, and I am delighted to welcome you to our program today. It's, it's great to have you with us and to have you uh, 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 a part of this ongoing discussion as we find our way through the, the pandemic and, and new and, and exciting ways of living out God's mission and being church together. So welcome. I'm delighted to have you with us. As we begin, wanted to invite you to uh, acknowledge the territory in which you're sitting. It's a, for, for those of you who, who aren't normally with us, I think this is an important practice as we, as we gather each time to remember that we are all sitting on land that has been inhabited and has been nurtured by people for oh, 10,000 years or more. So if you could just take a moment to put those uh, those names in the chat. I'm not going to read them all because I, I have embarrassed myself too many times trying to twist my tongue around all of the names. But to, let's just take a moment to, to read them as they come up silently and to and pause and reflect on what we're seeing. Thank you, friends. I'm acknowledging the I'm also acknowledging with Lauren that the Wendat and the Petun First Nations, the Senecas, the Mississaugas of the New Credit, the, the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, which is an agreement between the Iroquois Confederacy and the Ojibwe and Allied Nations. Oh, thank you. Thank you for your acknowledgement. Thank you for being aware of where you're sitting today. So as you know, we've been uh, spending time on Thursday afternoons as church leaders, sorting well, what it means to be church as the conditions around us are shifting and changing. Uh, everything changed so dramatically in the middle of March, and I think many of us have spent a lot of time kind of pivoting our programming and trying to figure out what we do next and, and what does it mean to be church in this new reality. And over the last 10 weeks, we've looked at a bunch of different things, some of which have to do with with the, um, you know, the, the core of, of what we do on Sunday morning. Some of it have had to do with fundraising and generosity and stewardship and those kinds of questions. Some of those, some of the things we've had to do have to do with funerals and, and, and uh, ways to take care of the folks who would normally be sitting in our pews on a Sunday morning. The piece that we haven't really touched as strongly yet has been, how do we live out God's mission in the world? It's so easy when a crisis hits to immediately start thinking about survival. What are we gonna do and how are we gonna make sure that we, 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 we continue to do all the things we need to do? And that's important and that's human nature and that's a part of what we need to do, but it's not all of what we need to do and it's certainly not all of what God calls us to do we are called not simply to take care of ourselves, but to, to, to make a difference in the world. Folks over at the Edge Ministries have really been working with a, a, a subset of all of our congregations on exactly those kinds of issues. And so it's exciting to me to be able to welcome them into leadership in this Thursday afternoon series and invite them to tell some of the stories that they've been uncovering and to invite us all into a kind of creativity around what does it mean to live out our mission. So I'm going to invite Carla and uh, Lauren to, to step in here. I can't remember which of you was going to first. I think it was Lauren, but I'm not sure. Anyway, whoever was on the schedule to go first, come, welcome, introduce yourself and uh, tell us what we're about today. And it's even more confusing because Lauren and I look the same. So, <laughs> um, so uh, thank you for so much for coming today. And I think that we don't like to tell other people's stories. We actually like to have them tell their own stories. So we have quite a few guests here today to talk about how they have pivoted, come up with something new, um, or really thought outside of the, the box or, or the church, so to speak, at this point in time. And so I'm gonna invite our first speaker as Sarah from Vancouver Island and how they've pivoted the work that they're doing. So Sarah. Thank you very much, Carla. So um, our church invested in a social enterprise um, at, in the fourth quarter of last year. And that enterprise is an in-home care business 
where we provide anything from companionship right up to personal care. So we're, so personal support workers um, are going into homes and allowing people to stay in the safety and the comfort of their own home longer. Um, and, and surprisingly, um, there's even a market for, uh, for companions and caregivers to go into seniors homes um, because they're not getting the personal care that they need there. So we started that in January and we're very excited and, and moving along and, uh, and then COVID hit. So, you know, what we had to ask ourselves, um, what is the need out there and how can we pivot and what can make a difference for some people? And we were struck by um, initially the, the first few clients that, um, that we, a couple of clients that we had that were just receiving companionship. So we were going into their homes for somebody um, and, and maybe help them walk their dog and, and grocery shop and, and do some meal prep or play some games. And they um, obviously with the, the safety, the risk was too high to have us in their homes. And so we said, but surely we can still provide a service to these people because their loneliness hasn't gone away just because COVID's hit. In fact, it may even be exaggerated. So um, we started to offer virtual companionship. And so we, our caregivers were able to continue their care for those people. And then we were struck by, well, maybe people don't have the technology to do virtual companionship. And then maybe we can hit more than one person at a time and uh, create a community for virtual companionship. And um, so that is all the conversation and that led up to us creating something called story time. So at four, I'm on the West Coast, so four o'clock in Victoria and seven o'clock in Toronto and various times in between over the supper hour between here and Toronto um, and the East Coast, we offer story time and we read for about 30 minutes and people were so excited to come on and say hi. We wanted to start our reading right at the top of the hour. So we've actually started opening the Zoom room up 15 minutes early so everyone can say hi and say what the weather is or show their pet or show the garden. And uh, it's really light uh, conversation. We then read for 30 minutes, give or take, um, to this uh, a continuous story. And, um, and then we usually have five minute debrief on the story or we laugh about something that was on the story after. And it, it, we also record, we don't record, we separately record the story and post it on a, on a website for people to go to that can't make it every day and still want to keep up with the story. And so we have, I thought the best way perhaps is to um, read a few of the testimonials we have for the community, but I would say there's about 20 people on the call every day minimum. Um, we had over 40 people um, going to the website to, uh, to listen to the stories and I expect that it'll just grow. Um, some of the feedback has been that um, on Saturday we're going to start doing short stories so that it's a beginning and end to each session each week and people can get closure. But we've also had some fun with uh, reading some old books. And because we're recording it and putting on the website, one of our challenges has been around copyright. And so we're choosing old books. And um, so initially we thought our audience would be seniors, but I can say that our audience, at least online, has been uh, between 45 and 96 is the age range for the people that are joining. So just a few of these testimonials, I'll only take another minute or two here to read through them, but one of the most many people around the world can likely relate to the feeling of daily brain fog and the lack of structure during the COVID pandemic. Just like families, Storytime provides their audience with an enjoyable and engaging program every day of the week at a set time. This little bit of structure and entertainment provides audience members with a great comfort and community, perhaps similar feeling provided by wartime radio dramas. The five stories read so far by Fiona, I am not the reader, by the way, um, Fiona is and she is exceptional. The stories that have been read so far have been fun, informative and suspenseful. The Zoom platform enables Storytime audience to become an engaged community. From Victoria, BC to Brisbane, Australia, the audience members begin and finish each episode with a lively conversation relating to the book or other, other relative subjects. So at this point, I should mention that we've had people from BC, Alberta, 
um, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, Ontario, Nova Scotia, New York, uh, Arizona, Florida, and Australia. So we do have a worldwide group. So it's funny as some of us are saying good night, we're saying good morning to the Australians. Um, I've enjoyed story time very much. Love the camaraderie. Meeting new people during isolation is a real treat and quite unusual. Uh, story time has become a much anticipated focal point of our daily routine. Our mother at age 96 and I embrace story time as a welcome diversion in these COVID times. And we hope the readings will continue even as stay at home constraints are eased, particularly during the winter months ahead. Um, so I think you get a flavor for it um, of, of, what we're, of what we're creating, but we've, you know, we just thought that we were going to be reading and if one person showed up, it would be great. And now we have a community of um, anywhere from 20 to 50 people and, um, and nobody knew each other and everyone's connecting and really creating that uh, sense of connection and community. And that's how we chose to pivot is to make a difference for people. Thank you so much, Sarah. I'm thrilled that you're able to be here with us today and to share this story of the way that your uh, particular community has pivoted. So thank you for taking the time and sharing your story. If folks have specific questions for Sarah, I'd invite you to put them in the chat box. We're gonna keep moving along because we have a number of stories we want you to hear. Um, uh, this kind of feels in a way like a story time, I think, <laughs> this session today. We're, we're in, inviting you into a bunch of stories. And so that was a perfect first one to start us off with, Sarah. Thank you. <laughs> so if you have questions, I'd invite you to put them in the chat space and we'll kind of take a look. But we're going to keep going through our second and third speakers. Um, but just because we don't want to lose anything along the way, if there's something that you really want to make sure you get out there for Sarah, Put it in the chat box and we'll, we'll um, get to those before we head into our first breakout session. So I'm going to move us on to our second speaker now. And um, so I see questions coming in. Fantastic. So we'll get to those in a moment. So our second speaker is from Montreal. We are really excited to have Jennifer Forrest here with us from Beaconsfield. And Jennifer is going to tell us a bit about a new initiative that has been started at Beaconsfield in this time. So Jennifer, I'm going to invite you to, uh, you're unmuted, so I'll turn it over to you now. Welcome. Thank you very much for having me. Um, I was, um, we were speaking quite a bit with uh, Carla over the past couple of months, and I just wanted to thank her again for all the hard work that she did for us. It was very comforting to meet. Um, the new initiatives, uh, there were a couple of them. We definitely are concerned when the pandemic started um, were the newly arrived uh, refugees uh, that make a, a big part of our congregation. Uh, most of them are Nigerian and, um, you know, a lot of them needed, we knew that they were going to need some kind of help. And we have um, a community worker named... Uh, Addy, who basically we together we orchestrated an emergency food basket system. So every week we delivered approximately 12 baskets of food. And we also had a woman from our congregation who packed up uh, many bags for children, like a little sort of a fun pack with some candies and some paints and some coloring books and stuff like that. And it was really good because people we're not only getting, you know, canned goods and, you know, people's leftovers, but we, we decided that we wanted to give them comfort from home. So we brought them African food, um, you know, some semolina and the rice that they like and uh, the protein that they're used to and different things like that. So that was really appreciated. And as we had started the Women's Collective at Beaconsfield, um, this also tied in with newly arrived women and the rights of children and women, and we've been exploring that. And if anybody would like to join us, actually on the 27th of May, we're gonna be having a Zoom session, and it's called uh, Our Rights and Responsibilities as Newly Arrived Canadians. So that's gonna be presented uh, with us along with uh, Montreal City Mission. 
and it should be really informative and we're going to be having time for questions and answers as well so i can put my email in the chat and if anybody you know wants to connect i'm always here and I just wanted to also just last thing, thank our very generous and very kind hearted Reverend Sean Friday, who is an exceptional leader and um, You know, just very heartwarming to work with somebody like that. It's been amazing. So thank you, Sean. Thank you, Jennifer. And it's so great to hear your story. And I know uh, you had sent it, so it's going to be posted on the website as well. So that's great. Um, and what I really love about this is like, it's just such a response to what the community needs and really active listening and discerning that way. And so in this time, it's just showing how adaptive you've been, which is so critical. So that's lovely. We have one last speaker at this point in time, and that's Pam. And I I think we just need to mute Jennifer. Perfect. Um, and so for Candace, she's out of Shelburne Primrose Pastoral Charge. And this is, you know, we, we have Pivot, we have something brand new. And now Candace is going to tell us quite a few different things that are happening um, based on new leadership popping up and new ideas that seem to be springing forward. So at this point, I'd love to invite Candace, and I believe that. Uh, Steve also might have a video for us at this point. Yeah, I, th I think we're just going to roll the video here, uh, uh, Carlos. So let me uh, show that to you now. Good afternoon. I'm Reverend Dr. Candace Bist, and along with my husband, Bruce Lee, we serve the Shelburne Primrose Pastoral Charge in Southern Ontario, where we have been producing a weekly podcast for our community for the last two months. So my presentation is a mini podcast, but with pictures. We begin our time together with some lyrics from Leonard Cohen's musical poem, Come Healing, followed by Micah Bessie's tiny prayer for May 19th. Micah works in New York City, the epicenter of COVID-19 south of the border, and he has taken upon himself the spiritual practice of praying the news. gather up the brokenness and bring it to me now the fragrance of those promises you never dared to vow the splinters that you carry the cross you left behind come healing of the body come healing of the mind and let the heavens hear it the penitential hymn, come healing of the spirit, come healing of the limb. May 19th, tiny prayer for those who are feeling down and don't know why. May you take a long pause and a deep breath and may you stop thinking that you need to explain this inexplicable feeling to anyone, even yourself. And may you remember that this place is not a permanent residence, that you have been here before and you will leave again, return again and leave again. And may the reminder that you know this daily balancing act well, bring you a bit of inexplicable balance today. Amen. Just like all of you, I imagine, we had some pretty interesting events and visitors planned for this spring. We canceled all of them on March 15th, the same day we closed the doors on both our church buildings. Then, just like everyone else, we had to figure out what to do. 
we decided to work with the resources we had on hand and to match them as best we could with what we felt was needed in our neighborhood, not just the church, the neighborhood in its entirety. Did it work? Well, I suppose that depends how you measure things. Before being a minister, I worked as a television producer and director. My husband is a professional musician. As we found ourselves on house arrest with no visitors to come play with us, we headed to our home recording studio and with time on our hands and the magic of technology to round out our two-man band, the idea to make podcasts emerged. If you listen closely to our podcasts, you would know we are following a pretty standard liturgical form. But as we wanted them to seep past the church walls into the wider world, we kept the framework somewhat concealed. And even though there are scripture readings and prayers, they are offered in a myriad of forms alongside modern sacred texts from Mary Oliver to Pete Seeger to dialogues from current movies. The completed podcast is posted on Facebook, iTunes, and our website, as well as being sent out as part of a twice-weekly email correspondence that includes videos, links, and more detailed information on the spiritual practice of the week. Everything is downloadable, including our music, and you are so welcome to use whatever is helpful to you in your ministry and your community. You can change the world one teardrop at a time one heart mended one hand held one dream come alive answering unasked prayers reaching out Thank you. So we have Candace here with us. And I'm going to, there have been a few questions for Sarah, um, our first speaker. And if you have questions for Jennifer or Candace as well, what we're going to do now is, is have a few moments for any questions. And then we're going to break out into some small groups for about 15 minutes. What we hope to do in this time is to provide you with a plethora of stories that might ignite your own imagination. Uh, not the sense that you might take exactly what Candace is doing in their context and, and do it in your context if that doesn't make the most sense, but that by hearing the stories of those who are really listening to the spirits movement in their own neighborhoods and being aware of what is needed in their particular context, um, that that might inspire you to listen and to be aware of what might be possible in your own context. It might look similar to some of the stories you're hearing here, or it might look totally different. And that's why Carla really hoped to provide an example of a pivot, a new thing, and then something entirely different. And we'll follow the same structure in the second half of our session with our uh, partners who are going to tell their stories. So before we break into um, small groups, just in the chat, are there any other questions? Sarah Bowder has answered the questions that were asked um, about tech support and provided the link to story time. Thank you, Sarah. Um, Sarah, there was also a question of how the stories are chosen. Oh, you're gonna type it? Okay, so Sarah's typing the answer to that question in there. Um, fantastic. Before we, we break out, are there any other questions? I'll just give a, a quick pause because I know sometimes it can take a moment to type out the questions. Tim, I see your hand. Do you want to type, oh, is your mic off? Okay, Tim. Well, hi, uh, it's a question for Candace. Uh, in the video, uh, she says that she reached out to find out what the needs of the community were my question is, how did they do that? Great question. Thanks, Tim. 
Candice, are you able to unmute there? Let's see, can you unmute Candice? Um, there we go. I actually had to pull a piece of the um, podcast out, which, so it might make a, because the second part, we did the podcast, and then the second part to that um, was that we um, uh, have a series of Zoom gatherings in the evenings that do parenting classes and meditation and stretching for elderly and those sort of things in the evening, and then the podcast is on Sunday. But the response, I guess, the how of how we do that is that we're just always talking to everybody all the time. I just keep coming back to the same word for the last 10 years, and that's conversation. I, I'm an embarrassment to my children. I just talk to everybody everywhere all the time. It's humiliating if you're with me, but um, you have a conversation and people say this and you discover that um, everybody right across Canada needs marriage counseling at the moment. That's my, that's my take on matters. Um, so really just um, chatting with people and hearing and also just observing. I mean, we do crisis management and you see who comes in and what was needed. And um, the thing about the podcast that, that really filled that need was that, um, and the younger people have said to me, they love them, they love them, they love them. Why? Because they can listen to them in the car, they can download them, they can, you know, they don't, they can, ha they can be listening to them when they're driving their kids places and stuff like that. So I wanted something, the podcast was interesting to us because it was flexible and it felt very modern and it felt like something that was accessible to everybody and that was absolutely part of the larger conversation thanks candace that's fantastic um wonderful uh follow up for you candace rob has asked if you and your husband would do some workshops on online worship production i'll let you and rob connect and you can chat about that um and sarah has um put uh, an answer to how how they choose stories in the chat box as well. Thank you, Sarah. So there might be more questions that rise up for you in the next uh, little bit. And just if you need, if you're someone who needs to jot them down to remember, do so. But what I'm going to invite us to do now is move into our small groups. And these will, Steve's going to put us into to breakout groups. They'll be randomly assigned. So you'll likely be with people from a variety of different contexts. And I invite you to think about and to share with your group what has resonated with you from the stories that you've just heard. Where have you experienced the spirit's movement in these stories? And where might the spirit be leading in your context, in your neighborhood? So like I already said, it's not that we're hoping you'll you'll take exactly what one context did and try it in, in your context. That likely won't work. But it's about listening and being aware of those conversations that Candace has has offered us such a, a good insight into as, as Jennifer shared, being really aware of who was in their community and what the specific needs were. And that comes from relationship. And I know in the context of Beaconsfield, that was a relationship that was longstanding and lasting. And so it allowed them to pivot and also do something new in response to that. So I invite you to think about these stories and hold the, those alongside your own context. And we're gonna take about 15 minutes in the breakout groups. Um, I also invite you to work together to be aware of who's in the group with you and making sure everyone has a chance to talk, trusting one another in that. So if if you're in a group of three people and you're yourself are talking for more than five minutes, um, to be aware that that means someone won't have as much time to talk. So just being aware of that, navigating this time together and really hearing for, or listening for what you hear in this time. Is that clear? Sounds good to me. So, okay. Steve, over to you. <laughs> sure, so friends, you'll, you'll notice that I've put the discussion questions into the chat. You can access the chat from the from the breakout room, so you can go back and open it again and have a look at that. Um, in a minute, I'll push the button, and you'll be invited to go into a breakout room. I'm suggesting that the, the the leaders, our presenters, don't accept the invitation, but everyone else can do that. 
And once you get there, you'll see that there's a countdown clock up in the top right corner of your screen. That'll tell you how much time you have left. We're, we're looking at 15 minutes for this group. So I'm going to get out of the way so you have more time to talk, and we'll see you back here in 15. Thanks. Uh, first speaker, Paul Taylor. Paul is here from FoodShare. Uh, many faith communities are partners with FoodShare. I myself serve uh, a church here in Toronto that is a FoodShare partner, and one of the highlights of my Thursdays is seeing the food boxes arrive and folks coming and picking up their vegetables and their food. And um, the neat thing about this example is that there are many similar organizations in many urban centers, as well as farmers willing to and excited to work with faith communities in rural areas. So we hope that you'll hear this story from FoodShare and, and similar to what we've done in the first half, think about what that might mean in your own context. So Paul, I'm gonna turn it over to you now. Okay, thank you so much, Lauren. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you folks for the invitation. Uh, what I thought I would do is I would tell you a little bit about food share and some of our programs, how we, and then of course, how we pivoted uh, as a result of uh, COVID-19. So the first thing I'd say is that food share is a food justice organization. We were founded in 1985, which I think is pretty important because in terms of history, it was four years after the first food bank was founded in, in Canada. So I think, um, you know, food share took a step back and said, well, you know, the types of food at that point that were being provided by food banks were largely, um, you know, food that was high in sodium, high in, in sugar. So we said, well, let's uh, introduce another option uh, that provides people with access to affordable produce. So, and, and, and all of our work is guided by the premise we recognize that in this country, uh, Canadians have a right to food. So uh, we've had that right since 1976. So we really wanna make sure that folks have opportunities to access uh, affordable produce and the like. One of the things that we do is we only use grade A produce. So we actually don't take donated produce. We don't sell donated produce. Um, there are lots of other folks that are in that work and that's great, but that's not what we do. We, we really want to focus on grade A produce and that way it lasts a lot longer for folks that are trying to stretch their budgets as well. So I mentioned that we're a food justice organization and for us that means not just responding to emerging, emerging need, but also working to challenge and highlight systemic issues, uh, systemic inequities that cause some to have more food than others. So really looking at the root causes. We're guided by our board, but also an Indigenous Advisory Committee, an advisory committee made up, and, 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 and another, sorry, the Indigenous Advisory Circle, and an advisory committee made up of folks from communities experiencing food insecurity. So we've done, a, a, you know, so when we think about challenging some of the systems, you know, things like income inequality, we kind of live, we walk the walk and talk the talk. So we actually have introduced a ratio, which says the highest paid worker at, at food share can make no more than 3.7 times what the lowest paid mark worker uh, makes at food share. We also do things like provide tampons and pads in all of the bathrooms. We have a no interest emergency loan program and a bunch of things like that really aimed at um, responding to inequities in our society. So when it comes to some of our programs, again, recognizing that people have a right to food, we've actually um, partnered with over 50 communities across Toronto to uh, build what we call good food markets. And many of our partners are actually uh, churches or, or, or other um, uh, faith-based groups. So these are like affordable produce markets that look very much like a farmer's market often, but in, instead of prioritizing local food, we're focusing on um, affordable food and often much of it's local, but the, the key highlight is that it's uh, affordable. We also have a mobile good food market, so a vehicle that's transformed into a um, bit of a food truck filled with produce that goes into communities uh, and sells produce. We do a lot of farming. Um, we, we're involved in student nutrition programs. So we feed over 200,000 kids in the city of Toronto in their schools. 
and then also operates a social enterprise called the Good Food Box, um, which we've just added coffee and honey and crackers and bread to. Um, but what we did uh, once COVID-19 uh, struck pretty early on is we said, oh my goodness, here we have this social enterprise that delivers produce, a box of produce right to the home homes of our customers um, across the city of Toronto. So we immediately started raising money. Uh, and what we, we did is we said, we're gonna raise some money and we're gonna give away free boxes to people that have been affected by COVID-19 or that are really struggling. So we partnered with a bunch of organizations like the Workers' Action Center here in Toronto, Black Lives Matter Toronto, um, a, um, organization called Maggie's that works with survival sex workers um, and also with groups like Windermere United Church uh, and St. Matthew's and a bunch of others, you know. Um, so we actually went in terms of distributing our good food box each week from 200 deliveries a week to 5,000 deliveries a week. It's been a huge scale up. In the, since the time we've been doing this, we've been able to provide 200,000 pounds of fresh grade A produce uh, to folks in need right now. And I just want to highlight one of the things that we're super proud of um, in close is that we've done this in the context of really thinking that COVID-19 means we've got to help as many people as we can. And we've also got to keep as many people employed as we can. So not only did we keep all of our staff employed, we provided folks who were out making those deliveries with a $4 an hour increase. Um, uh, included all of our staff in the good food box delivery. So every one of our team gets a good food box. And then we hired 50 new people to support us with the scale up, uh, largely international students that weren't covered by federal aid programs. So really thinking about what can we do, much like churches do, how can we leverage our resources, our skills and our capacity to support uh, need right now. So that's us. Wow, there is nothing that I could say to follow up with that. You have said it all, Paul, and uh, I just, everything that you were, as you were speaking, you're right, it just sounded like the values of the work that FoodShare is doing so in line and, and what we're seeing with so many communities of faith. So thank you for your wonderful work. Um, it's, uh, I think it's very inspiring. I, I, I felt the energy on that. And so I hope the rest of you did. And so with more, no more ado, I'd love to introduce our next speaker. Uh, Tim Dawson is actually a musician with the Toronto Symphony Orchestra. Um, they've had a partnership with Kingston Road United Church for some time. And um, now with COVID-19, there's a new idea that is springing up uh, that Tim is gonna tell you all about. Hello, everyone. Um, uh, I guess you can see me. So thank you so much, Carla, for inviting me to be a part of this. Um, I just uh, want to say I'm a, a musician in the Toronto Symphony. I played double bass there for 40 years. And I go to Kingston Road United Church in Toronto. So I have my foot in, in two, two camps. And I see uh, a lot of similarity between churches and symphony orchestras. <laughs> I think we face uh, many of the same struggles particularly now, uh, because the Toronto Symphony season, which normally ends at the end of June in early July has been canceled. Um, and we don't know when we're gonna be able to return to concerts. Certainly uh, the, the, the thinking is that the fall uh, will not, we will not be open in the fall either. So perhaps uh, January, we're hoping January we'll be back. But how will we back? That's a big question. Um, because it, maybe not until we, we get a, um, you know, we can get a uh, shot, uh, will we feel comfortable being in large groups of people. And uh, churches, of course, with all the seniors that we have in our population, we don't want to put anybody at risk. And so we have the same, many of the same issues. Uh, right now in my church, of course, the doors are closed. Um, and we're starting to think about, well, when do we open and how do we open? And how do we do it safely? And, and, and everybody's facing the same issue. It's just that, uh, like I say, in my case, uh, I'm part of two organizations that are facing this at the same time. Uh, so um, one of my passions for many years is to put uh, chamber music concerts together, not just classical music, but uh, uh, concerts in churches because I particularly love churches. I love the acoustics in churches. And um, so for the past seven years at our church, we've had the Kingston Road Village Concert Series, which uh, Carla mentioned. 
and um, it uses a model that is kind of unique, I think. Um, and I'm, I'm proud of the fact that where most concert organizations uh, lose money in their concerts, uh, ticket sales only cover a portion of our, of our um, costs, uh, we actually make money for the church. So over the past seven years, we've, I don't know, we've, we've made well in excess of $30,000 for the church, I think, just doing, we used to do six concerts a year. Uh, now we do four concerts a year, two in the fall, two in the spring. And um, uh, the musicians get paid. And of course we have expenses, but for those expenses, we have sponsors that cover it. So that before a note is played in the church, um, the expenses are covered. And then the ticket sale revenue goes directly to the church. So it's, it's a kind of a wonderful model. Uh, it works because we're volunteers, like the people like myself that put these concerts on are volunteers. And this is our way of giving something back to the community. So the community gets fabulous concerts, the church makes some money, uh, it helps to sort of spread the name of the church and the neighborhood, and, um, 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 and, and the musicians get to put on concerts and they get paid for them. So, so a lot of, it, it, uh, it's a win-win for, for more than just the usual model of putting on concerts where someone rents the hall, puts on a concert, and then sells tickets. This one, it just, it's a little bit more uh, expensive where, uh, like I say, it, it benefits more people. And before these concerts, I had a group called The Buck Concert, and we did the same thing. For 20 years, we did concerts that raised money for charities all over Toronto. We raised over $400,000 for various charities. The musicians all did it uh, for a tax receipt. And uh, so again, we, we just, the, the idea of making it benefit as many people as possible. Uh, number one, it helps get the word out about the concert. And then it just, it feels so darn good. <laughs> you know? So, so uh, how are we going to, deal with the COVID and, and uh, I've uh, spoke to Carla about an idea of, of mine and the Toronto Symphony is uh, I'm just a bass player in the orchestra I'm, I'm not part of management uh, so I really have no say how we're going to do things but one of the things that I would love to do and I could see us doing is um, for musicians not just to follow but to actually lead in my case Torontonians lead us out of out of this COVID. And, and one of the things they're saying, when does the pandemic end? Well, in part, when science tells us <laughs> it's over. But the other part is when we get so darn tired of being cooped up in our homes, it's kind of a combination. And, and it's, it's a very nebulous thing where, where the end of the pandemic is. But when it's safe, my idea is that when it's safe uh, for small groups of people to come together, um, we could have musicians, in my case, from the Toronto Symphony, come a small group, perform, performing in a church where people are socially distanced and using the same kind of a model where we find a sponsor, the musicians get paid, and then the proceeds from the ticket sales go to help the church because churches are in need just like, like uh, the musicians are. So the, in a nutshell, that's, that's the simple idea. And, and if, if it worked here in the city in Toronto, I could see it working across Canada, um, wherever there's, uh, there are musicians, really. And it doesn't have to be just classical musicians. Um, it's it's a, a model that, that I, I know from experience this model works. So I, I just think, uh, again, by broadening the, the idea so that it helps the most people possible, is the most satisfying, the most wonderful, and uh, the idea, again, of leading the way uh, so that people, because people need music, and we could actually be an active leader in the community to help people come out of the pandemic. So that's, that's the story. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Tim. And I really appreciate how you've already seen the model work, and you're now uh, allowing your imagination to see what else is possible from that. So that's a really wonderful approach. And uh, I think what we've seen with Embracing the Spirit is that half the stories uh, and half the projects that have come forward is actually not just from the community of faith, it's actually in partnership and relationship with others. And so this is a great experience, uh, story because you're talking about your full life, Tim, about your life at Toronto Symphony Orchestra, your life with Kingston Road, and how you're really seeing how that is the same thing. It's holistic. So that's lovely.
Thank you. So last but not least is Erin Morgan from the Ontario Cooperative Association. And um, I, I not even begin to start telling you about what her idea is. So I'm going to leave it to Erin. <laughs> Thank you, Carla. Um, can every, can you hear me okay? Okay, good. Because sometimes my, sometimes my so up here doesn't work. So I'm going to start out by apologizing in advance because I'm probably going to get interrupted by one of my four children at some point. <laughs> it happens every single webinar that I have a guest, a little guest host. Um, so I'm going to start out, I'm going to share my screen in a second, but I'm going to start out by saying thank you so much to everybody for having me as a presenter this afternoon. I actually grew up in the United Church and for my entire career I've been drawn to the cooperative movement, uh, first with a farmer cooperative called Organic Meadow and then after time in the broader agricultural sector back to the movement um, at the Ontario Cooperative Association. And I don't believe that this is a coincidence. I believe the two movements, the church movement and the cooperative movement uh, that are building sustainable communities and focused on those in greatest need are what keep me and probably many of you motivated and excited to serve every day. So now I'm gonna tell you a little bit about our idea. Um, let's see if I can do it as a slideshow. Anyway. It's only going to let me do it this, this way. So um, for people not yet acquainted with the um, cooperative movement, um, our businesses are incorporated provincially, owned by their customers, producers, or employees who work together democratically toward the common goal of a successful business and a sustainable community and following internationally shared principles. So I know this is a lot. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about the principles. Uh, there are seven of them, as I said. Um, the first is voluntary and open membership. Anyone can join. Uh, democratic member control, which means one member, one vote. Nobody gets more than one vote, no matter how much money or how much time they put in. Member economic participation. So everybody has to, uh, everybody has to participate um, in order to be a member. Autonomy and independence. No one owns the cooperative, but it's members. Education, training, and information uh, shared amongst uh, themselves, the members, and also with the community. Cooperation amongst cooperatives, to me, one of the most important principles, and concern for the community, the other most important principle in my mind. Um, and so, um, as we rebuild after COVID-19, there have been so many different voices, including many in the church, calling for us not just to rebuild what we had, but to build the future we truly want. Our organization is putting our principles into action and working on a number of initiatives that we believe will contribute to a more equitable future where everyone can thrive. I'm going to briefly touch on two examples, but there are many more ways our cooperative model can be utilized to ensure equality, democracy, and sustainability for all. And we welcome all conversations with anyone interested after this webinar, and please don't hesitate to reach out. My uh, contact information is on the last slide. So the first example is a cooperative to support those Ontarians who are self-employed where many are working precarious jobs without benefits or access to social safety nets like unemployment insurance. And unfortunately, the largest numbers of precarious workers are women, new immigrants, Aboriginal people, youth, and those with disabilities. So you can see some statistics there about precarious work. So our idea um, is that our organization is building a cooperative where each freelance worker will be offered a low cost membership. Their membership will make them an owner of the cooperative, but also equivalent to an employee in a larger company so that they'll have access to benefits like medical and dental, social assistance programs like EI, administrative tools like taxation and invoicing, immediate invoice payment, and other value-added benefits like access to professional <coughs> services like accountants and lawyers, and group retirement savings. Bless you. Finally, the cooperative will provide promotional opportunities to others within the cooperative to use each other's services, but also advertise to the larger community. The benefit to society at large will be seen in a more stable freelance economy uh, that will have a stabilizing effect on Ontario's economy overall at this very volatile time. 
Um, the next idea, the second project I'd like to highlight uh, that our organization is working on is uh, our business succession work. We're partnered with Libro Credit Union and other professionals in the community to assist businesses across Ontario that are struggling due to COVID-19. As you can see on this slide, there are many who are struggling and unsure about the future. Where business owners are not able to continue or sell their businesses, employees or community investors um, and ownership may be the best and most sustainable option. It means the employees or the community invest small amounts of money per person that add up to enough for the current owners to either exit the business or remain as a business partner. The community members or worker members become the new owners of the business and are able to operate the cooperative in this new post-pandemic world. Their knowledge of the community um, they operate within allows the businesses to adapt to the needs of the community as they change post-COVID. Our goal is to save as many jobs across Ontario as possible while encouraging community investment in the businesses that sustain their communities. So as servants of Christ in this big world full of uncertainty, we can make a huge difference in our communities through cooperation, democracy, and service. We at the Ontario Cooperative Association believe the better world we seek begins with the essentials of a safe and decent life being made available to everyone. People aren't asking for much. Food, shelter, stable work, and time with those we love. These basic needs bind and identify us as human beings, and if we are to cooperate, they will be within the reach of all. Cooperatives believe choices that benefit the most people are the best ones. Tomorrow needs us. Please join us as we enter the cooperative era. We encourage you to think cooperatively as we rebuild our communities. So there you go, some food for thought. Thank you, Erin. Fantastic. So we've heard three amazing and, and different uh, partnership ideas, three ways that partner organizations are responding to this time and working with a variety of faith communities and faith partners. Um, so I wonder, I see a few questions coming in. Rob is asking, Erin, is there any conversation about making investment in these co-ops eligible for RSP contributions? So um, a cooperative can, your, so your um, cooperative investment can be eligible for RSPs if you have a self-directed RSP and if the um, cooperative is large enough. So unfortunately, the process of being RSP eligible is um, an expensive one. And so you have to be raising at least a million dollars as a cooperative um, in a round of investment in order for all of the numbers to work out. Um, where it makes sense for RSP eligibility. But it is totally possible for people to invest in a co-op through their self-directed RSP. Fantastic, thank you. If there are other questions for any of our three partnership speakers, please feel free to put them into the chat. I'm gonna backtrack a little bit. Um, Therese asked for uh, Tim, who are the sponsors of the, the TSO idea um, and, and the partnerships in the past. Oh, you're, you're muted still, Tim, just a Sorry. second. There we go. Still muted, <laughs> just a second. There we go. I think we both hit the button at the same time, Tim. Okay, <laughs> hi. Uh, we have a variety of sponsors. Uh, a, it being including Ed, Edge <laughs> that have helped us with a, a pro project I didn't even talk about. But um, uh, it, at first, I used to just go around and sell ads for the programs for our concerts to cover the cost with our modest concerts. And as the concerts grew in scope, a woman in the church uh, took it upon herself to raise money amongst her friends and local businesses. So in our case, the, the sponsors are local. Fantastic. Thank you, Tim. Um, and I saw one from John here um, around bylaws so that musicians can perform in smaller venues like churches. John's wondering if you know anything about, uh, about that, Tim. Um, so John's saying, I wrote this week to Mike Tanner, city music officer, about 
finding ways to fix bylaws so musicians can perform in smaller venues like churches. I don't know anything about that. Great. Well, maybe something for us, uh, a variety of folk to look into. Great. Um, and and um, yeah. I see one for my reading as well. Yeah, perfect. And that's how can uh, churches participate or support partner with the food share or good food box. And um, on that one, I know that Windermere United Church, he specifically did speak about. And for that, uh, they actually end up, instead of having a food bank, because they weren't able to actually do that anymore, they buy 168 boxes a week or, or a couple hundred boxes a week in order to actually donate that. And so that's one way. But then I think, Lauren, you can probably talk to how St. Matt's has partnered with uh, Food Share over the years as well. Yes, so um, we're St. Matt's is a site for food box drop off. So it's a partnership between the church and food share in that there's some responsibility and role of the, the church in receiving the boxes and, and uh, managing some of the communications, uh, the money for the boxes, and then, and then those are um, paid for between the, in our case, it's our administrator, amazing administrator who handles it all, and our treasurer. Um, and so for people who are interested, they contact the church and then the church is sort of that hub that manages the list and the orders. There's a variety of different sizes of food boxes. Um, and then it's really, I mean, as I mentioned earlier, it's one of my favorite days because it then becomes um, a social thing, of course, when we're able to, to gather and be together in that way. But the, the hall at the church where, where the food boxes are dropped off becomes this really vibrant spot of people connecting and meeting one another. So um, in, in that case, I think re just reaching out to FoodShare and they have uh, a process for becoming a, a partner and working in partnership with them um, and then figuring out what the, the management of that looks like. Okay. And so I have a question for Aaron and uh, Tim, if you'd like to. So as a partner um, and as another organization, uh, why are you interested in talking with communities of faith and specifically the United Church and some of your future dreams and initiatives that you're doing? Um, well, the United, the United Church makes the most uh, sense to us as a partner because, well, we originally got in contact with you, Carla, because of the work you were doing um, helping small businesses get started within uh, using your church facilities. And so that, um, of course, was a really good um, intro to our organization because we thought that if you're building community businesses or supporting the development of community businesses that probably have a social purpose, then a lot of times the cooperative model is the best model to use to ensure that the social purpose is retained over time. And so that's a big reason why we want to partner with like-minded organizations that are trying to develop businesses and partnerships around a social purpose where we are trying to build businesses with a social purpose and support community development and we want to support those in the community who are doing the same thing um, to to usually usually the opportunity is to develop a model where everybody in the community has a say and an equal vote in how that uh, business model is created and uh, and so then we partner to ensure that you have it kind of laid out in the way in a governance model that makes the most sense to retain that social purpose over time and to make sure that everyone's voice is heard so I think that there's a lot of alignment there and like I said there's always one who joins this is Margo. Hi, Margo. <laughs> Tim, did I see you speaking, but you're muted. There we go. Oh, yeah, no. Oh, there we go. I was going to say that uh, uh, music and churches go together already. Uh, that's something that we're all familiar with. And so if we can f find a way to uh, bring people together, number one, uh, to hear beautiful music and, and at the same time help financially uh, churches with this model. Um, it, it, I, th I think it's a good thing. 
So just to let folks know, because of time, we have had a little chat amongst Steve and Carla and I, and we're not going to go into a second breakout session. Um, so if you have more questions, we're gonna we're gonna invite you to continue putting those in the chat box. We'll continue in this plenary space until your questions are done, and um, we'll use this space. But the question that I was gonna invite you to think about in the breakout session, I still want to offer, and that is what excites you about the models of partnership that you've heard through these latter three stories. And in thinking about what excites you about them, who are some of the partners that you know about in your own community's neighborhood? And what partnership relationships might be possible in your context? And often the partnership possibilities that emerge also come from that deep listening and knowing our context, which we talked about with our first three speakers um, that emerge the awareness of, of the partners. So Steve just put those questions in, um, in the chat box as well. So as we continue to have a few moments of questions, and then as we go from this time together, that was what we were hoping to inspire within you. Open up your imagination a bit about what might be possible in your own context and what some partnership opportunities might look like for you as we begin to continue or continue to reimagine what church could be, especially in this time through COVID and post COVID. So there's a number of comments that are coming up, uh, especially around music and spirituality. So Candace, um, such a great conversation between spirituality and music. Uh, Candace's husband would tell you that his music is his spirituality and definitely deeply theological. Absolutely. Um, and I think that could be a whole other webinar on its own. Hey, um, Felicia, a uh, profession before going into ministry was music, a violinist formerly with symphony orchestras and freelancing. Uh, and Felicia's commented, not quite as easy to make this manifest in the life of the church. Uh, actually, hard to organize a concert series, so much time involved. Um, Tim, do you want to respond to that? I see you. I'm more than happy to help if anybody wants to contact me. Amazing. It's, uh, it's, it's uh, my belief is you start small mm -hmm. and, and let it grow organically. Fantastic. And uh, Tim, can you put your email in the chat box? Uh, Felicia's asking for that. That would be awesome. Uh, Jennifer Forrest has has noted community gardens with an exclamation. So definite um partnership and and outreach there um and john ryerson has offered a great resource for music online from the Com canadian music center so the link to that is in the chat um and definitely uh so part of my carla my colleague carla works really closely with embracing the spirit i know that many of you have worked with her through that uh, my role is I get to work a, a little more closely with some of our new ministry leaders. And so as we were talking about mu music and spirituality, one of the new ministries that I work with um, in Ottawa came to mind, and that's through Mackay United. They have a new ministry called The Kindness of Jazz and looking at uh, jazz music in faith communities and also um, inspiring leadership of musicians and a partnership of leadership between faith communities and musicians and uh, providing space for musicians to have their own spirituality and faith nurtured as well. Um, so fantastic. Cheryl is wondering, um, Aaron, if we could get your contact info. Cheryl would love to be in touch. Awesome. I see a head nod. Amazing. Uh, Candice has said the quiet garden movement out of England. We have a meditation garden in one of our churches. It's an international partnership. That's amazing. Awesome. And Rob has noted, I'm amazed at what people have been able to do with a little instruction with recording studio stuff with just their cell phone or laptop and the right software. Fantastic. So I don't see any more questions emerging. I'm going to turn it back over to Steven 
to, to wrap us up. And I just want to thank our presenters and thank all of you, our participants, for engaging in discussion, bringing your own context um, and your imaginations to what might be possible. So thank you all and, and thank you to our six storytellers today. Thank you. And thank you, Carla and Lauren, for pulling all of this together. One of the things that has really excited me today is not, not so much seeing the, the, the well-polished programs that have been presented. Of course, of course, Carla and, and Lauren went for the, the best examples they could to inspire you. What's excited me most is to see the variety of things that people can do with whatever their gifts happen to be. And the significant thing here is not that we've got a professional musician and a professional podcaster. The significant thing is that we've got individuals with gifts who said, who am I? How can I respond? How can I get excited about this and draw other people in? And while I agree, not every one of us can be podcasters. Everyone has gifts. And... Uh, that's what's been most inspiring. So thank you. Thank you to each of you for, for going with it and sharing your gifts and sharing your passion and challenging us to do the same thing in a thousand different ways, because that really is what it means to be church. Thank you. This draws to a close our time together this afternoon. Wanted to tell you just briefly about what's on the drawing board for next week and the week after. Uh, there's a lot of talk now about how do we move back into our buildings after this eight weeks or 10 weeks out of them. Uh, I don't think anybody has quite all the answers yet, but here's what we're thinking about for next week. We need to at least have a beginning conversation around what does it mean to be church as property managers and, and uh, uh, um, houses for tenants and as people start to move into our buildings even if it's not our worshipers to start with maybe it's it's people who are starting to come in in much smaller groups maybe it's people who are just coming into the office maybe we're still worshiping online somehow or other we have to make sure that our buildings are safe for whoever comes in whether they're their guests whether they're employees so the the things we're thinking about for next thursday are about how do we start to begin to think about moving back into our buildings? What are the pieces we need to put into place? And then following that, if and when we get to the point where we're allowed to worship in our buildings again, what does that look like? Somebody was mentioning in the chat that we can't sing until there's a, a, a vaccine. Oh my goodness, what does it mean to be church if we can't sing in our worship service? We're inviting some uh, some folks to give us some leadership in that area, hoping for that for the following Thursday. And after that, if those go well, and there doesn't seem to be a lot of new topics that we need to think about, um, we may take a bit of a break over the summer on these Thursday webinars. We'll see. Who knows? I mean, two weeks from now, the whole earth could shift again. But if there aren't obvious new topics coming down the pike, we may take a break for a few weeks and then come back at it again as, as the new normal or the fall normal gets a little clearer. We'll keep you informed as we go along. In the, in the meantime, thank you. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for your stories. Thank you for your imagination as uh, we struggle to be church together and to respond to the call to, to bring peace and joy and hope into a world that is hurting. And yes, Therese, summer is not cancelled due to COVID-19, but like everything else, it may feel a little different. Where do we find joy and peace in the midst of that? That's our challenge. And that's our ministry. Thanks for joining us, and we'll look forward to seeing you another time. Bye for now. <laughs>